Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Learn Live session on building and deploying to Azure using GitHub Actions. I am Mike Bazaruski, and I'm here with my colleague, Chris Ayers. How you doing? I'm Chris, um, a Fast Track Senior Customer Engineer, just like you, Michael. Um, this is going to be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We also have with us here, besides the two of us, we have our uh, fast track moderator Morrow as well. Now Morrow is not live in the in the uh, video here, but but he's watching the chat and helping to make sure that we're able to answer your questions as they come up. And by all means, please ask questions through the channel uh, as as you go through it, because we would like this to be an interactive session. That's part of the point of it being live is to be able to do that interactive Q and A. So what are we doing here? Well, the point of the Learn Live initiative is to be able to help you understand some of these topics that are also covered on the Microsoft Learn platform. So our goal here is to help you do interactive learning exercises, understand what videos are out there. All that is part of Learn, and we're going to take you through one of the topics that is covered in Learn. We also have a collection out there that includes not just references to Learn content, but also docs and GitHub Live content as well. That's at that AKMS Learn Live link that you see on the slide right now, AKMS Learn Live dash 200, uh, sorry, 20220629B is in boy. Uh, and that's a, that's a live link. And we may make changes to that over time as, as, as well as, as we decide to add other things and, and update things. But that's the live collection for the content. And if you go there, you'll see that Chris actually put that together. His name is on it. So that's part of our goal here is, is to help you understand what's going on with those, with those resources. Now, our objectives specifically for today are to talk about GitHub Actions and workflows talking about how to configure your environments and your secrets that are feeding into those actions and those workflows, and then talk about learning basic CI and CD workflow. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means when we say CI and CD as well. Um, so I think we're good with the slides for now. Uh, Chris here, we're focusing on GitHub Actions, but we're both Microsoft employees. We know that Azure DevOps <laughs> exists as well. We've had that since long before we purchased Git, GitHub and before GitHub Actions existed. Can you talk a little bit about what, why somebody might choose one over the other and, and talk to pros and cons of, of, uh, of each and kind of what our view is on that? I mean, that's a, a really complex question. Um, Azure DevOps, formerly TFS, has been a mainstay in many organizations and enterprise organizations. And it's still a great product that has a lot to offer. Uh, GitHub brings some amazing things to the table as well. And, and for many organizations, I think it's probably a better together story. Um, you know, if you're working with something like enterprise agile or scrum processes, the Azure boards give an amazing experience for work tracking and tying together the work with the code and your pipelines. Now, it works amazingly well with, with GitHub. So you can leverage GitHub repos for all of your code storage. You get a lot of features out of just leveraging GitHub repos to, to store your code, like Dependabot and security scanning and secret scanning, where you can kind of prevent secrets getting into your repositories. But um, you, you know, it really depends on your needs. If, if you don't need some of that enterprise uh, agile methodology and you don't need manual testing, you can leverage GitHub for everything. They've done a ton of amazing work um, across issue tracking and conversations. Um, they have a full CD platform there. And you know, now with environments and protections, we've got a lot of, of auditability capability on the you know approval and release side. Um, but for some organizations, if they need everything in one package and they, they have some strict integrations, Azure DevOps might still be the right answer. So it, it it's a conversation to have with you know your your partners or your uh, your Microsoft reps, but both of them work very well together. Sure. So. When we're talking about DevOps, though, we should probably take a step back to ask, what are we talking about? Just in a in a in a big picture, right? In this session, we're not doing a 
DevOps 101 session here, right? We're sort of assuming that somebody has some DevOps knowledge, but I think we should make sure that we're just talking about the same things here and kind of level set a little yeah. bit. Um, one of our colleagues, Donovan Brown, colleagues meaning fellow Microsoft person, not a fast track person, um, he has a, a quote where he says that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. And that's really what we're going after with a DevOps mindset, right, is, is this mindset of improved turnaround, safer uh, system deployments, better outputs, fast feedback, fast automation, right, and getting higher quality, because really the underlying goal is to get higher quality software out to our users, right? That's really what we're trying to focus on there. Um, and that includes continuous integration and CD. And notice I spelled out continuous <laughs> integration, but I did not spell out CD. And that's because CD somewhat depends a little bit on who you ask, right? There's two different definitions of what CD actually stands for. Can you talk to that a little bit, Chris? Yeah, I mean, for our purposes, when we talk about CI, I think that's that's a pretty common thing. Um, we're building our code, we're running tests against our code, we're scanning our code for uh, dependent dependency vulnerabilities or security issues. Like we're doing some integration stuff, and we're making sure that what goes into our main branches uh, is good, builds, and meets our definition of quality. Now the CD part, like you implied. Are we talking continuous delivery or continuous deployment? Because those are two different things. And, and the, the main differentiator, I think, between those two is, is there a person involved? And, and I know that's a, a kind of a basic question, but a lot of times when we start down the CD path, it goes from a person on their dev machine is right-clicking and deploying something, which please don't, or they're zipping up some code or publishing a package and they're uploading a zip file or manually running a command to get their build artifact, their, their software, their website, you know, back in the day it used to be, we were FTPing it somewhere. Like now we have pipelines and workflows and things like that, that can repeatedly do the exact same tasks every time we have consistency, we've taken the, oh, did you rename it, put it in the right folder, did you set, and so continuous delivery gives you a place where you can have push button deployments and automation, but maybe you are deploying to dev automatically, but before it goes to a QA or stage environment or before it goes to production, you want a human to look at it. You want a human to approve that it meets the definition of acceptance that you've defined. Like that meets all my features. It's bug free. It's performant. It's secure. And so you can hit a button or, or do an approval and it can go to the next stage or to the next environment. Maybe it's applying a tag. The other way, maybe you have complete automation. You've automated your tests. You've automated load testing. You've automated security testing. You've automated acceptance testing. And if it passes all of your quality gates, if it does everything you've wanted it to do across the board through automation, go ahead and ship it out to production. Why not? It meets the definition of quality that you've defined in the system. And so that's that differentiator. Yeah, that's totally fair, I think, that the idea is of, is there a human involved in the loop, right? That's a really key I think a very easy way to kind of distinguish in both cases, you're still getting something out there, right? It's just, is there a person or is it kind of a magical automated sort of thing? Um, and certainly in Azure DevOps, if, if we do a compare and contrast a minute, going back to the idea of, of uh, sort of that, that uh, earlier offering, if you, if you will, um, AZDO uh, had in it CI and CD, right? It had it through classic and YAML pipelines. The classic pipelines, the original offering dating back to the TFS days where we had a graphical workflow editor and you were bringing different pieces together on a, on a canvas and walking through your steps. And you had the build and deployment, kind of the CI and the CD were really segregated from each other. It was really two different ideas and they were two different kinds of uh, build work, two different kinds of pipelines. Um, and that's a little different when we go to a more uh, newer setup 
where we're doing something like a more uh, like like the current YAML based uh, um, Azure DevOps pipelines, where we've got YAML underneath, and YAML is a text based document where we're basically editing that and managing that in our source code control uh, and working with that. So uh, really uh, taking it from a graphical kind of old school GUI kind of thing to a text-based, almost infrastructure as code, a build infrastructure as code almost kind of model, which is where a lot of organizations want to get to as part of their CI and CD. They want the builds themselves to be part of that model. And that's where that YAML comes in. But I think, Chris, we're going to start with that, with you kind of talking a little bit about YAML again, just to make sure, especially if somebody's coming from the classic workflow side in the, uh, yeah. in the Azure DevOps pipelines, what are they looking at when they go to YAML? And I believe we're going to switch to your screen and start talking about that. Yeah. Right? And this is just a, a, a quick demo. Like this is a site I've found that is phenomenal and YAML is used everywhere, but there, I mean, there's, there's specific keys and values and properties that are needing to be defined. You're using it in stuff like Helm and Kubernetes. You're using it in Azure DevOps. You're using it in GitHub. But there's usually just three or four simple rules that, that apply to YAML. So just to make sure we're on the same page. And if you know uh, these couple of rules, it will help you troubleshoot and debug things. So you know if you want a key and a value, you, you, you can just type in a key, do a colon and a space, and give a value. Notice on the right, we've got YAML. I'm just saying key value. I'm not even putting quotes around it or anything. And on the left, where it gets translated into a JSON type of object, it, it's defining the things uh, properly. And let me just zoom in a little bit just so it's clear. Um, you know, like I have a dog and they have a lot of favorite things. So, you know, I could list out favorite things by doing a colon and then saying they like treats, they like naps. And notice I'm doing uh, spaces after the dashes. And so I now have an array, like a list of proper or list of values just by indenting things. Now these are both indented to the same level. If I don't invent them to the same level, it complains, doesn't like that. Um, if I forget my dashes, it'll just concatenate, you know, and if I forget my space, it doesn't, it doesn't really like that either. Now we've got keys and values. We've got lists. The other thing we can do is we can make objects. So, you know, maybe my dog's name is Spot and their favorite things. are treats and naps. So now we've combined an object with key values with a list. So these are the, the building blocks we're going to continue to use as we go through GitHub Actions and we, we start looking at workflows. And there's actually two different ways to do lists here in YAML, correct? That's actually a great point. Uh, we could do We could do it that way. So you'll see both ways as we work through workflows. So th th that is an option. So we, we have our kind of a race syntax that way. And you know, we, we have it this way. Cool. And I point that out mainly because I believe, if I remember right, the GitHub docs use one format specifically, but both formats are possible and you'll find examples with yep. both of those. So I wanted to make sure that we kind of called that out before we got too far into things. Um, there is a question from the from the attendees uh, about what the difference is between Azure Pipeline and GitHub Actions. And I think that's kind of one of the things we're going to focus on as we go through this session, right, Chris? I mean, that's one of the things yeah. we kind of made sure we wanted to point out as we go. So we're still pretty early in the discussion. I, 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 I think to be able to really address that question directly, I think it's more of a stay tuned and watch as we go through things. And, and I think we're, we're going to hit that as, as we yep. go, kind of drawing analogies to them as we go through. Well, things. why don't we dive into it a little bit? You know, um, we, we've got some example workflows and as we go through, we can kind of talk about it, but 
Um, you know, we were talking about CICD. You were talking about build and releases. And um, workflows are a little different. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have workflows that work on anything. Like, you know, we, we can trigger them on code things, just like your CI builds. But we can also trigger them on other act events that happen inside GitHub, um, which is where actions kind of separate themselves from pipelines. So right. now your DevOps pipelines, you, you, I think you were a little bit more limited to the code side of things. Yeah, it was very much tied to basically user request, right, on demand, or a check-in or previous pipeline completion. A depends on B, B finishes, then A can happen. Fairly limited. Uh, there were a few other edge case things, but that was pretty much it. Um, um, Git, GitHub, though, gives you a lot more triggers, correct? Yeah, and, and we'll get into all those, but I want to point out something. So I'm in, my, I'm in a repo out on GitHub, and I have a folder here dot github workflows so in this repository all of my workflows are stored in this folder so i'm, I'm in a subfolder so dot github can actually hold a bunch of files and folders for different types of configuration things but the workflows explicitly list live in dot github workflows the other thing to kind of notice i have a lot of them i have many different workflows they can all live together and I have multiple ones. So that trigger we talked about, what what those events that happen that might kick off a job, a, a workflow or not, those are defined inside those workflow files. Now with Azure Pipelines, you could have YAML files exist in your repo, but you would then have to go and create a pipeline pointing it at a YAML. Like you had to do a step to kind of link a pipeline to a YAML file. Here. If a YAML file exists, it kind of gets picked up by the system and it, and it shows up under, you know, my actions tab, which is showing all my workflows. And that's automatically picking up just, just because you've checked in that code, you've pushed that code up in into your GitHub repo. It's automatically realizing, oh, this is a YAML file in the proper place. I'm going to show it on the actions tab, correct? Now, let's just take a look at this one. This one's a basic workflow. Um, Notice we had that array syntax we talked about. So I've got this, I've got a name, that name that I, I clicked here or that I have here. If we come over here and we look at our actions, um, oh, I think it's because I opened the tab or something. I just had them all showing. Uh, there we go. This is proof that we're in a live demo, folks. No, yeah. No, so notice not, this recording. name here. Zero, 00 basic workflow. That is just the display name that I'm defining right here. So you can name your workflow whatever you want for the most part. And then we have another keyword on. And this is that trigger. This is the thing that tells your your workflow that it wants to run. Now I'm I'm just listing out, hey, if you you push code to any branch, if you do a pull request to any branch. And then there's a special one, workflow dispatch. That's if I like manually want to trigger a, a, a job, you know, a workflow, I can. So I don't have to push a new code update. I could just manually say, I want to run this workflow. And that's that's actually kind of an interesting thing to point out. If you did not include that as an on entry, you would not have the ability to manually request that execution within the UI, correct? Right, without any changes. Or, um, you can rerun old things and I'll, I'll show you that UI and we'll dive more into triggers in just a moment. But the other interesting thing about workflows is um, we've got jobs. So workflows, uh, like events happen, they cause triggers that run a workflow. And then our workflow is made up of one or more jobs. So we can have multiple jobs in our workflow and by default, they, they're parallel. Like if you have five jobs, it'll try to kick off five jobs, all running at the same time. Um, you can name them. So this is the name of this job. I've named it build. Uh, it runs on a, an image. We're, we'll dive into that in a moment. And jobs are made up of one or more steps. 
So where jobs are all kicked off in parallel, unless you, you tell it you want some sort of order, uh, steps are always run sequentially. They always start at the top, first step, second step, third step, blah. Like, and those, oh, those jobs are pretty, pretty much anything you want to execute, right? So it's much more like an Azure DevOps modern pipeline where it could be a build, it could be a deployment, it could be whatever, right? Or packaging or whatever. Whereas in the classic Azure DevOps pipelines, build and deployment completely separate, right? Those were separate yeah. pipelines in the modern Azure DevOps workflows uh, concept uh, pipelines. Uh, we can mix and match as we see fit. GitHub follows that same idea, right? So we can mix and match whatever actions we think make sense to happen as part of that job, right? Yep, and we can see here, I'm, I'm, I just kicked this off. It's listing the YAML file it's using for the workflow. It's, it's showing me the trigger that happened on this batch. I can look at the status of my build while it's running. And so there's like, hey, I requested a label. Uh, it's doing things and the job's already finished. Um, we can look at a couple things here. So I'm running in an Ubuntu VM 2004. I've got an environment when we'll touch on that momentarily. Uh, it sets up some some secret or some some permissions and things. It downloads an action, which we'll get into. And then it, it runs that little hello world script. So very basic minimalistic flow. And you, you, now, you have a whole bunch of those showing. So it's not like you're limited to like one or two right. or something. It's a fairly, you can easily have dozens of these. And right? there's a ton of triggers. And, and we have a lot of flexibility and control in our triggers. So we could say, I only want this one workflow to run if I'm pushing into main or any folder under release. So maybe we had a workflow that does some production things and we only want it to run on our main branches. We don't care if you're doing stuff in dev, we want to limit things. What if you only want newer versions of your pipeline to run if your code is tagged with V2 or, or your, your things are tagged? Or maybe you only want to build your documents if your HTML and JavaScript files update. So you, you can do path filters you can do branch filters. You can do tag filters. We can list out arrays both ways. We have that syntax. We have this syntax. Um, there are also ignore branches, ignore tags, ignore paths. But you can't mix and match branches and ignore branches or tags and ignore tags. There's some syntax you can use. You can put an, like an exclamation point right in front of it, like a not symbol. And that'll be like, don't include that. So not that one. And I'll show some examples of that later. And then you can also schedule it. And scheduling kind of works on uh, cron, cron type style scheduling. So, you know, 30 minutes, uh, on the 30th minute of hour five and 17 of any day, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you can have dependencies as well, right? Where you can say one yeah. job depends on another one. So we, we talked about maybe we want to do multiple jobs, you know, that we, we, we could do multiple jobs. And, you know, this is what that might look like. So we've got jobs. Remember, we're just listing out multiple things. I have job one, I have job two, I have job three. And you said and, those all execute in parallel, right? But the point of setting a dependency is it's one of the ways to, yeah. to change that, right? Yeah, so if I look at this, See, I've got job one, two, and three, and I kicked it off, and all three are running at the same time. Um, either one could have started first or last. There was no real order to it because if you think of this as like a, like a stage or an environment, all three of these kicked off at the exact same time, and they weren't dependent on each other. So if I was trying to build and deploy something and I didn't have a dependency in place, my deploy would try to kick off before my build, potentially. And then what would happen? We would get a failure because it wouldn't work right. Like there's no build to deploy, so it would fail. Now, another awesome, awesome feature of GitHub Actions, so, I, so I've added some dependencies here. Notice the visualization is changing. 
it automatically detects the jobs and how they relate to each other and and shows you those relationships so job two is going to wait for job one to finish and we, we you know it's going to only run if it's successful i mean you can control that and overwrite it but job one is finished now it's going to execute job two you know and i can drill in and, and see the logs you can see the workflow it ran on um you can see the commit hash of the repository that, that's running it. Again, manually triggered through the workflow dispatch. So, so we can do fine grained control over these. Now, would you like to see what that workflow looks like? Like how we define those relationships? Absolutely, yeah. I was about to, I'm literally about to ask if you could show that to us. All we're saying is needs. So this job, needs job one so you can you can specify some dependencies that way and job three needs job two now we could tweak this we could make a change here like i could come up here and edit this and go you know actually i meant for job three to also depend on job one i had a build step and a test step and a deployment step and that's how I wanted it to run actually so I will say now I'm I'm, I'm doing this for demo so I, I, I uh, I'm just letting it go but if I come down here you can see I've updated my pipeline and now just like before where all three jobs kind of ran at once. Now we have two jobs because they have no dependencies on each other. Right. Right. They can run in parallel. Doesn't care because the only dependency we've said is job one. Perfect. All right. So that shows a lot of flexibility and that helps explain how you can mix the build and deployment, right? Because that's one of the things that sometimes folks get, get a little confused about is wait, how, how can I do that in Azure DevOps Classic? Because they were separate entities, it was pretty easy to make sure I did that right. Yeah. But if you start crossing the streams, as it were, something we've been told not, not to ever do, except when you have to, that we can still build in that requirement, right? Through this dependency sort of setup. So um, yeah. what if you wanted to have a situation where, because we talked about you could have these things executing, they might be long running, especially for something like, if you have a long deployment job, for example, it's not that crazy for deployment to maybe take 10 or 15 minutes, for instance. What if you wanted to say, okay, as a developer, I need to be able to do CI builds, right? Because I'm following best DevOps practices. I want to do continuous integration with my unit tests and so on. I do a check-in, but wait, there's this long deployment thing going on. How do we manage that as far as making sure that I'm able to get my stuff done without waiting on this other job? Well, there, there's a couple of things that, to talk about. One, there, there's a lot of limits. Like you, you can see I have many, many workflows listed. You can have a very large number of jobs. There's many concurrent jobs that happen. I, I don't want to get into all of the, the limits right now. Um, they're, they're available out on GitHub, but there's... Uh, workflow limits, there's job limits. I think you can run a given job for like six hours if need be. There's um, a lot of different options for, for how many billing minutes you have. But a lot of these jobs, they're all running on hosted agents uh, that are hosted by GitHub. Now there's the other option, which, which we can talk about as we dive into it, into self-hosted agents where maybe we want to run it uh, in our own machine or our own container. I know that that was similar to Azure DevOps. And you know, what what were some of the reasons that you leveraged some of those self-hosted agents when you were dealing with? Yeah, that? so that's that's a good question. I think that's kind of a natural transition. I think to talking about a topic here that that we certainly need to talk about uh, for the Azure DevOps case you had the Microsoft hosted agents, the quote unquote Microsoft hosted, and then the self hosted agents, the Microsoft hosted agents were running up on a VM in Azure somewhere, right? And you, it, we would document what was on those VMs, uh, but it was kind of out of your control. And those VMs were thrown away 
and rebuilt from scratch each time you ran them, which meant uh, a few different implications, right? One of them is you couldn't do incremental builds because you were starting clean each time, which for very large code bases can be very painful. So sometimes incremental builds are the difference between being productive as a developer doing CI and not being productive, right? So that could be very painful in these larger code bases. It also meant that because these were running in an arbitrary Microsoft Azure place, you couldn't access private access uh, resources, right? So you couldn't use a private virtual network or a um, Azure function with just a private endpoint or access on-premises uh, resources. Like maybe you were trying to deploy to an on-premises web server. Well, the Microsoft hosted agents didn't really have the ability to do any of that because they were off running in some vague Microsoft cloud, mm -hmm. hand wavy Microsoft cloud. You didn't really have that capability with the self hosted agents. You had a lot more control. They were running wherever you chose to run them. Right. And you could do things like incremental builds because they were long running. In fact, some developers would even run self hosted agents on their own build machines where they literally could have all the build stuff running on their local machine. Uh, so we yeah. had kind of both of those models. It sounds like though, in um, it sounds like we're the same kind of thing over in the GitHub case, both of those options. Is that right? Yeah. So the GitHub hosted runners, there, there's a lot of uh, variety. So you, you, there, they post the hardware specs, but you know, we can do, when we talk about runs on, when we talk about the pools we're using to build our software, we have Windows, we have Ubuntu, we even have Mac OS. And I, I kind of showed it a second ago, you know, if I'm, if I'm running on my build and I'm looking at my build, there's a, a step that I didn't add that's set up here, that setup job. And I mentioned that we could see the operating system. Well, there's also the virtual environment. So this is listing out that I'm using Ubuntu 2004. And there's a link here that takes me out to GitHub but it lists out all of the software that's installed on my agent machine that's building and releasing my software that's doing my jobs. And, and that's a and long list. Too. Like, there's a huge amount of stuff there. On those yeah, things. there's a ton of stuff installed, stuff for all sorts of different clouds, all sorts of different languages, all sorts of different tools. There's even like, you know, browsers and Selenium installed with environment variables every version of .NET, uh, databases are installed. And so all of these are available for you to pretty much build and release software out of the box with, with limited changes needed. Uh, and when we're looking at these runners, yeah, I mean, we, we can go and look at what's available on any of them. So here are the links to each of the packages. So if I was to pick like a Mac OS one, for instance, I would have things like homebrew, or I would have Xcode if I was maybe going to emulate Mac uh, application development for mobile devices, I could do things there. On the Windows side, we also have Android. So all of these things are installed and configured. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, that's, that's actually, I think, one of, for, for, for me as a developer, that's actually a really exciting thing because one thing that's always been an issue for me in the past I actually do own a, a um, an older MacBook, but most of my machines are Windows machines. From a development point of view, that meant that developing against iOS and iPad OS in particular, there was a blocker there for me because those tools run, the official tools to do that all run on Mac OS. With the hosted uh, agents, the GitHub hosted agents, I could build something like a Xamarin code base, for instance, that deploys against Windows and Mac OS and um, Android and iOS and iPad OS and have all those out there without having to run all of these different environments and manage all these different environments because I have this magical hosted running or environment, which again, Azure DevOps had a similar, the Microsoft hosted, but the GitHub ones I think are a bit more uh, expansive in what's available to you and a bit more interesting as far as what is installed on, on, yeah. on those pre-built VMs for you, right? But uh, but again, it sort of has that issue of, well, for instance, what if I want this specific version, right? Like I want this specific release of Node.js. I don't want the most recent one. I want this older one for some very specific reason. These agents, we're just telling you what's there, right? And you don't have a lot of control. Correct. That'd be another reason to go with the self-hosted, right? Well, 
there are many steps that we'll talk about. So like, I want a certain version of node. All that means is that the machine has all of those node versions available. And when you do stuff like set up node, set up .NET, set up Python, you're, you're setting the default version to be the version you asked. Um, now, like I, like I was getting to with self-hosted runners, um, you can have them at the organization level or the enterprise level. If you're using uh, Gib Enterprise or GitHub Enterprise Server, you can have them at the org level. You can even have repository level runners. So you can have different runners uh, if needed. Now, and something to remember about your runners, um, it's a bottleneck potentially. So when you're using GitHub hosted runners, you're allowed so many concurrent builds. The same thing applies kind of to how many self-hosted runners that you want to spin up. They're only going to be able to handle so many jobs at once. So if you only have one CI environment, for instance, if you were to do that with your on-prem or VM hosted, self-hosted runners, remember all of your jobs are going to go through there, all of your workflows. And so if you have a lot of teams and a lot of developers working and you don't have something that lets you scale, so having scaling in response to your runners, you can bottleneck yourself and people can wait a lot longer than they need to to get CI, CD uh, jobs running. Now, uh, you can, like I said earlier, better together, you can use Azure DevOps and have pipelines pointing at you know, an Azure Pipelines YAML file in one repo. You can also have workflows doing security scanning or Dependabot in that same repo, and they can work together, but just it's going to be a complex situation if you're trying to pass, uh, pass artifacts back and forth between them. Sure. Someone might be doing that as part of a migration path, though, for example, right, where they're slowly migrating sure. parts of their uh, uh, pipelines over to GitHub Actions, and other parts are still behind in the Azure DevOps side. Um, or you may even have different teams that have different preferences within the organization, right? Some teams may feel more comfortable with Azure DevOps pipelines. Others might feel more comfortable with GitHub Actions. There's nothing stopping you from doing both of those. It's just a question of the complexity and effort involved in, in yep. working with and managing two different environments at that point, right? Now, I, I've talked about running multiple jobs. I don't think I, I spelled it out explicitly, so let me go ahead and do that. When you have multiple jobs, each individual job is running on a different runner, a different uh, agent, essentially. So each one is is a fresh, brand new, you know, runner. So that that's a runner. That's on a different runner. That's on a different runner. Each job has its own um, runner that it's using. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so, okay. So we've talked about the concept of a job, right? And we had the jobs that are running on runners. And we talked a bit about how the runners can be the GitHub hosted and how that maps to the Microsoft hosted agents. Or we have the self-hosted, which maps to the self-hosted agent concept uh, over in the Azure DevOps side. But one thing we haven't really gotten into yet are what these jobs are actually doing, right? We've kind of touched on it a little bit, but I think we're, we're kind of walking down a road here. Uh, it's fairly fair to say, I think, where we're starting with jobs and we talked about jobs are executing on runners, but we haven't said exactly what uh, is happening within those run, like what's actually happening in these jobs. And that's kind of our next thing to kind of talk about, I think a little bit, right, is is the steps, right? The, the next piece walking down this is that our runners are running steps. Can we talk a little bit about what's happening in those steps? Yeah, so um, I, I just started this workflow to run and a lot of stuff flew by the screen. So once it finishes running this job, I'm going to scroll up and, and show you what's happening. We're going to talk about it a little bit. So notice I've, I've labeled a couple of these tasks with different shells. And that's important because, you know, right now I am running on Ubuntu. I'm running on a Unix or Linux based machine. And so when I say um, a simple command like run, I want to run an echo, 
um, I'm going to default to using Bash because I'm in a Unix environment or Linux environment. Now, CMD, that's a Windows thing. CMD doesn't exist, but, you know, and, and so how I define interaction with my environment variables is a little different. Steps are only two things, really. And, and I'm going to bring up this workflow just so we can talk about it and, and, and review what's, what's going on there. You're either running a command, which is just like I bring up a prompt or a terminal and I execute a command line command. So I'm doing my echo. Maybe I want to use PowerShell or maybe I want to use Python and I can give it some little interactive things. So my run, my step run is really just I'm typing this on a command line. And so if you're on Windows, it'll default to CMD. If you're on Linux, it'll default to Bash. But you can override it if you want. That's one thing. So I'm going to run some commands. So that's that's the script, right? We had the same kind of concept in Azure DevOps, but presumably there's smarter things than just running scripts because that would be fairly limiting. If all you, I mean, obviously scripts are kind of wide open, but there would be a lot of work you'd have to do to get even basic tasks done. So I'm assuming that we have something smarter available. We do. Is that right? So we can leverage actions. So, and I have a couple of specific examples here. We're going to go talk about these and figure these out together. But I just wanted to say. Like we can leverage actions. And so actions are um, executables, JavaScript containers. They are groups of steps that we can give arguments to that do things. This particular action, checkout, checks out our repo. Now, how do I know about these? Uh, well, I'm sure we can dig into that, but you can see I can specify a specific version so I can lock things to like one version if I want. I can do like major version syntax. I, I you know, like, hey, I want 3.0, 3.1. I can just say I want the main branch version of it. I, there, there are other syntaxes for leveraging actions, like if you want them locally or if you're trying to do them from remote stuff. Um, but there's a lot of actions out there. And how, okay, so a reasonable <laughs> next question is, where do you find those actions, Chris? Well, we got a marketplace. It's right at the top. It's one of the major features of GitHub. We've got all these actions. So we can we have over 13,000 actions that are out there right now, which is incredible. They're all open source. They all have capabilities. So we can look at that checkout action that we were just looking at that's right here I can see it's got stars it's got blue check marks I can click on it and we can get more information about it okay so is, is it one of the questions that came up in the in the chat was somebody was asking about custom actions um, and I don't think we have time to get into the details on that too much here um, but they were asking about what the restrictions are uh, as, as far as languages and environments for creating custom actions. Um, do we have time to at least spend a second or two talking about that? I know we don't have time to get into it in any real detail, but I want to try to address the yeah, questions. Yeah, I mean, we, we can bring that up. There are, um, let me bring over that link. Again, we are live, folks. That's what you get for being here live as you get to. Yeah, so here we go. Actions are individual tasks you can combine to create jobs. And so you can leverage uh, a Docker container action, a JavaScript action, or a composite action. So um, Docker container, you can use pretty much any set of tools or code or whatever you want as long as it runs in Linux. So okay. Linux containers, make your own container that does stuff. You can use JavaScript. So there's a, a toolkit that GitHub uh, exposes. There's an API that lets you interact with stuff. And then we can do composite actions where you can actually take multiple actions and kind of make one bigger kind of wrapped action. So like a Docker container one, there's a whole tutorial that walk you through it and creating your action, defining your uh, action YAML. Same with JavaScript. They have some samples for it. 
And and our uh, friendly moderator, Morrow, pointed out that because you've got the ability to do the containers, and you kind of touched on this as well, you don't have to do like JavaScript. You could do Python, Go, C Sharp, whatever it is. As long as, right. to your point earlier, as long as you can run it in that container, you're good to go. Um, another question from the, from the chat, which I think uh, we probably should have mentioned, to be honest, we were talking about runners a little bit. I kind of, so I want to kind of loop back to it in a, in a, a little bit going back, uh, just before we kind of get back into steps, um, is around the uh, limits for uh, using GitHub Actions with the paid versus the freebie, uh, the, the free options. I know we don't want to spend a lot of time getting into the cost side of things, but I know we, we were hoping to at some point kind of just briefly explain that. Um, could, could you briefly, and again, I don't want to get into a lot of super detail for time reasons, but I think it's a reasonable question to, to uh, ask because a lot of those limits yeah. show up when we talk about runners and the running side of things, right? Gotcha. So uh, the, those limits. Um, yeah, we have, um, let me... So under the Learn Geek Start Actions, there's workflow billing and limits. And, and these are kind of called out across the free and paid plans, like how many concurrent jobs you get versus Mac OS jobs, uh, the queues and um, retention. Uh, so, so this is kind of covered in that, that billing section. There's also, uh, I believe, uh, a minutes... Yeah. So right. about you, yeah, the, and and you yeah. had mentioned earlier around there were limits around how long something can execute and so on, but it's they're very large, right? Like I remember we were talking yeah. through this yesterday as part of our our prep for today, and we were both kind of laughing about how how huge some of these numbers end up being, um, just as far as how long you yeah. can run things. Like some of the limits are on the order of days, which is yeah. kind of crazy, honestly. Yeah, and and this is something that you need to look at for your organization. Um, again, we don't usually get too deep into that, but it's right. something yep. that, to, to be aware of. All right. So going back to steps, then we've talked about uh, scripts. We've talked about actions. You showed marketplace a little right. bit, which, yeah. is, which is awesome, right? Because that's where we're finding well, all of these. Yeah. And this is also tells us how to use our, our, our actions. So we found an action. Uh, we kind of got a little derailed. So sorry about that. No, it's my fault. I, I'm the one who derailed us. So I'm putting us back on track now. <laughs> we, we found an action. We can see all the different versions that that action has out there. We've got badges. We can see information about them. We, this is what's awesome. For every action out there, pretty much, they show you how to use it. And you know, there's this with keyword. This is how we pass inputs into an action. So with this repository or with this, this branch, or with this SSH, you know, how to, how to access it with, I want to clean, or I want to fetch depth. And so they, ha they have some really great uh, examples here that I can just come down here and go, hey, I want to check out my main thing, and now I check out a different repo. They give you examples, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah, good documentation. Everybody likes good documentation, right? That's I, I can go out and see if there's an issue that I need to go report if there's not one there. And then if I want, like the links here, take me right to the repos. Like if I'm kind of curious how they do stuff, I could come out here and look at their own YAML. I could see how they do things. So it's all open. That's for, awesome. For anything on the marketplace. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually pretty pretty cool, I think, because sometimes folks kind of wonder, like, wait, how does this thing actually work, right? And and a lot of developers, their devs tend to fall into, I think, two buckets as far as what I'm about to say goes. Either you read the documentation, you expect the documentation to be awesome, and other folks are like, documentation is for, is for losers, I'm going to go read the code, right? And so it's yeah. nice that they've got both options. Uh, pretty good documentation, and you can go read the source if you feel the need to do so, especially... To your point about opening issues on these, it's sometimes helpful to be able to say, well, I went and read the code and here's where I think it's failing and he, and kind of work through that through an issue like you would anything else on GitHub, essentially. So, And, and I always look for the blue check marks. Those are verified creators. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some amazing actions out there written by people. 
But like when I'm dealing something with an Azure login or Docker, I want to come to the official documentation. I want to see my options like using service principles or the newer ways of doing like open ID connect to, you know, write my uh, connectivity into Azure so I can deploy things. And they give you examples on how to do these things, which is awesome. But that's why I, I think the marketplace is just incredible. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's always growing, right? There's always there's a there's a small but dedicated community of folks that are creating actions, not just within GitHub but externally as well, right? Community that goes back to your verified author point. Uh, so th it's very much, and, and it's a good example of how GitHub kind of crosses environments as well, right? Crosses vendors, crosses environments because there's actions that are. It's not just all .NET. And Azure, right? Like that's that that Git <laughs> GitHub wouldn't be GitHub if that was the case, right? And I think everybody at Microsoft understands that. So you've got yeah. actions out there for deploying to other clouds and and for working with other language environments and so on, which I think is actually a part of that credibility that you have working in the GitHub action side is that wide support. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Um, so we've got actions that we've now talked about. Um, one of the things that we talk about in Azure DevOps when it comes to customizing pipelines and customizing steps that are being taken is feeding in variables to help say, I'm going to reuse content by feeding in a variable to customize how this thing executes or a set of variables. How does that work here in GitHub Actions Land? Well, I'm going to just start with environment variables and yeah. we can build up from there because right. just like with Azure DevOps, there are predefined variables that you can access from your workflows. So up here at the top here on line 16, I'm saying ENV. So I'm going to define some environment variables. Now I'm running on Ubuntu. So I'm running on a Linux machine, but I'm just, remember, just key value YAML. So I'm defining, hey, I have a greeting. Hello, world. Now because I'm on an Ubuntu machine and I'm I'm doing just a run. This is going to be executing in bash. And so in bash, I would, I would access environment variables like that. So those environment variables are in my bash uh, process when it starts running that command. And you're, and, and you aren't needing to escape the dollar sign, which I think is an interesting thing to point out. Um, it's just passing that on. It's just literally passing that on to bash and then bash is reading that environment variable like it normally would. Yeah, so if we go and look at our run, you know, again, it, it's listing out my workflow. It, it's waiting on one to spin up. It's already ran. So it invoked echo hello, uh, echo greeting name. So it pulled those environment variables. You can see it defined, hey, the, those were the two variables for my environment. And this was the output of it, hello world. So it, it passed those in. Now, if we quickly look back at the previous uh, workflow I had under steps, what's interesting here is on bash, I'm doing dollar. If I'm on a command prompt on Windows, I would need to do percents. If I'm on PowerShell, I would need to do env colon path. So there's different ways to access the environment, but it's but it's the, the native way you would do that, right? That's part the of the native point. way you would the do native that. way. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So another, I, th I think a really cool thing about variables is, you know, in, in Azure DevOps, you, you have uh, variables, but you can do them for your release. You can do them for like a stage, right? You, you can override variables with each right, other. Yep, yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when we look at variables here, you can see I've got three variables, greeting, name, and location. It's saying hello world from step. And, and this is just an example so that we, I, you know, I, I know it's a contrived little example, but if we look at this envir environment variable, we've got a location at the workflow level. So we're defining environment variables at the workflow level. I can also define environment variables at the job level, and they have the exact same key. I, 
can also define environment variables at the step level. So now I have the same key at the workflow, at the job, and at the step. And so, okay, so if you're doing that, a natural question is, what's the precedence there? It could be, you could argue that either way would make sense. I know which way I would like to have it go, but why don't you tell us how Actions actually handles that? So if you think about it, this workflow gets defined with location workflow. And when the job kicks off, it's going to get this as a default value. And so if nothing overrides it, it would be workflow. But this overrides it. So now that value is job. And if nothing overwrote it, this would have location job. But this one overrides it. And so the last one that sets it for that given context kind of wins. Right. That makes sense. Last one in or closest, if you prefer to think of it as closest, yeah. that, that one wins, which is how I admit I would expect this to work. It would be a little weird to me if it worked the other way, but I could see that somebody might have that expectation. So I wanted to kind of draw that, draw that out there. So far though, you're doing, you're not doing much with these variables. I mean, it's cool that you can print them out as environment variables, but I'm thinking that you can do some more intelligent stuff there. I know in Azure DevOps, there's some capabilities to do more than just kind of blindly inject the value in. I'm assuming you can do that here as well. Yeah. So here, um, you and I'll be clear. You can you can't use uh, environment variables uh, at the job level. You can run use them at the step level. But I can do like some, with environment variables some conditional like if this value equals hello like run this step or don't run this step. So I can have some conditional execution at the step level. We have a lot more capability when we get um, at, at, to the next couple of topics. But at this level, you know, if we're running these jobs uh, and we're running all of these tasks, we could do these ifs and it, it's pretty simple. You can see here we say, we'll run hello because we had hello as our greeting the hello ran, but the goodbye didn't run. You know, we, we can take this a lot further as we go through the conversation. Uh, maybe we want to use uh, what repo are we in? Are we in a production repo? What uh, branch are we on? Who checked it in? What was the task? Was it a pull? Or I mean, was it a push or was it a pull request? Like we can interact in different ways based on these conditionals, running steps or not running steps. But there's more you can just do than conditionals, right? I, I, I assume that there's uh, expressions to do different kinds of conversions and change things out and so on. Is that is that right? Well, I've, I've actually set up a pipeline with a bunch of complex examples, just like with Azure DevOps where you can do scripting. There are some it. functions that are available inside of uh, GitHub Actions. So we can format strings and do string interpolation, passing values. We can like ends with and contains returns things like true and false. So does hello world end with LD? Does it contain LLO? Um, we can give a JSON object, maybe a list of presenters. Now there isn't really a list, and, and, and let me let me go ahead and bring up this link here. So you know, we have bools, strings, and numbers. Like those are our data types by default. So for an expression. So if I wanted to store, um, if I wanted to store this array, I can't easily, but I can give it a string and I can then pass it to that function from JSON. So now I have an array and contains can look for strings in the array it can look for so contains works with strings or it works with items in an in an array and then i can do stuff like join so let, let's run this and see some of the output yeah but those also work with other places we could do ifs we can do other things with it so. and yeah, I believe the link is shared, but see, here's all of the, the current functions we have, like to JSON and from JSON, um, joining things, maybe doing hashes. 
if we want to know if an ob uh, a task succeeded or failed or was canceled, we can do that. Awesome. So we ran the job. And in the chat, Moro has in fact shared the documentation for, yep. for this, which is which so is we, we formatted out the uh, the formatted string. Does it end with L, uh, LD? Does it contain ELLO? Does everything contain Chris? And then we've turned that array of objects into a comma separated list. So we've got programmability and functionality that we can do. Now, I do want to point out, uh, you know, in the, in the previous couple of examples that we were doing, you know, we had ENV where we were defining it kind of at the top of our, our file. And this is actually a special thing. ENV is a, a special thing. It's, it's, it's actually called the context. And just to kind of explore that, so a context, there's a number of contexts that are defined out there. You know, our GitHub context, that's going to give you all of those predefined variables that you might not know about. Like, what are all defined by the system, potentially? You know, what branch are you on? What code base are you in? What build number are you dealing with? Um, there's also a context about the job, you know, to show about success or failure, uh, stuff around steps. And we're going to talk about these later if you're in the middle of a, a strategy or a matrix. Um, so, so as an example for that context, maybe somebody wants to have, uh, like, um, I will make a uh, package of some sort that's a versioned package with the version number as part of it. And I'm going to pull that version number from the, from the context. Is that a fair yeah. example? Yeah, I mean, you can see information about that, you know, where it exists, paths, uh, the environment that's being run, um, you know, what step we're on. You know, you mentioned the runner, you know, if we're in Linux. So we can use these contexts to um, set values, you know, set build logs, set, set tags. Um, do exactly what you were talking about. It gives us a lot of information that we can use. Now, there's a bunch of context, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's a fairly long list that that you're showing there because um, we're, we're pulling from lots of different levels, right? The, the runner yep. and the check-in, and there's lots of different sources of these contexts, and they're all getting exposed to you, which is pretty specific. Yeah, we can look at the inputs that are passed in, if we have dependencies of jobs. This is also where secrets are kind of accessed when we start accessing secrets. Well, and that that's a that's a reasonable transition because I was going to ask next, I think, actually about uh, these variables. Are it's one of the things that often comes up in real life is somebody's got a password they want to store or something like that, and they're going to make that available presumably in a variable. Um, how how do we um, how do we approach? that i think right so could you talk to to what those secrets are and how that works a little bit well those are special right secrets are special they're special to a degree i mean um, we can access them using that expression syntax they're on the secret context and so if i say secret name and that secret is not defined this is going to come back blank now notice i'm passing it two different ways which way do you think is better in the long run? Well, I'm going to guess, based on what we've seen before, that that second format, the one that's on line 36 in your example, that's passing in dollar name, right? So the command that's executing is going to show the dollar sign NAME characters, right? It's not going to show the filled in. I'm guessing that 33 is actually going to do a string substitution and fill in that secret value so that in the command, if you look at the command like in a log file or something, that secret will be exposed, whereas in the second version, that secret's not being exposed. Is that, a re is that an accurate guess? I mean, that's a pretty reasonable guess, and you're close. Um, because when I execute it, it does say dollar name in the log as the command line. 
Like that's what was run. But GitHub's pretty smart around a lot of its logs, and it's starring out that name. Now, what about the other one? Well, that one is just, it doesn't show the environment variable. It, 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 it detects that that was a secret, and it's not printing it in the log. But let's say I was running other commands on the system. And in, in Linux, you can do a PS command, and it will show a list of all the running commands. That PS command could have that in the command line being executed. You would see that in that PS command. So GitHub's being smart. They're being real nice, and they're, they're hiding things that they know about in the logs. But if you're running other commands, you could, you could figure out some of those secrets and just kind of dump them out, and that would not be good. Now, I, I showed getting this from this workflow file and just referencing secrets. Those are actually set up in your settings. So if we go to settings, we come down a little bit, we have our secrets here. Now there, there's some deploy keys we can leverage, but these are secrets for actions. Um, and down here I have a repository secret called name. Now you can have, organ it, when you're using GitHub Teams or organizations, you can have an organization secret that is shared across the entire organization. We can have repository secrets. And uh, we'll get into it in a moment, but you can also have environment secrets. What's, so. in your, what's sort of interesting to me about this is that there's a very uh, modern DevOps or DevSecOps uh, theory that you should have uh, custodians of secrets, right? And those may be different people than the developers, right? Meaning you may have somebody that knows a password, right? And that password is getting put in as a secret without that being directly exposed to a developer, meaning the developer doesn't know that password. They don't need Correct. to know it. But somebody who owns that responsibility, a security person can put that secret in there and then leverage that secret through the uh, through the secrets reference. Right. Yeah, and 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 there are um, there are ways to in your pipeline like leverage like a CLI to to get out um, secrets and put them into or, or get out key vault stuff and put them into environment variables. There are ways to have administrators enter these at the org level or the repo level so the developer doesn't need to know them. And you, you pointed it out. Like, I, if I don't need to know that, I can just reference the secret. If, if I give it a name that doesn't exist, that dollar C, that'll just be blank. It, it, it won't have a value. So if I don't know what it is or I haven't been told what it is, um, yeah, and you can add protections on that, um, especially when we start dealing with environments. And so that's that's a good transition, I think, as well, because I think that's my next thought here is when we start talking about things like passwords and so on, it's not that unusual to have, say, the dev environment versus the QA environment versus the production, where those secrets are one of the things that are going to be different, right? Like you may have a different username and password for each of those. Uh, how does that map to this concept that we're doing where we're doing deployments and so on? How do we get to that idea here where we're managing the uh, the, the target, uh, your deployment targets, if you will? Yeah, so we can create an environment. I just did. And if you want to have someone uh, review it or approve things before they can touch that environment. And that means access to secrets, do anything with that environment. You, you can come here and, you know, add reviewers to give an approval before something gets deployed to an environment. Okay. So, a, so a quality gate, like a reviewer quality yeah. gate. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can also limit things. So let's say this is my production environment, and I want to make sure that the only branches, the only Git branches that can deploy to my production environment are maybe a protected branch, or maybe I don't want it to just be a protected branch. Maybe I just want it to be only main. So I, I, I can configure 
like only my main branch is allowed to deploy to production after somebody looks at it. So I've got a little bit of control on, on those type of things. But then I can have secrets that are very specific to that environment. Um, and just like with, you know, if I wanted to define the name and, and now it's this would, if I was deploying to production, would override my repository secret. So if I if I defined that I was deploying to my prod environment, it would override my repository secret with the exact same name, uh, you know, name. And if I had an organizational secret, it would be overridden as well. So we're, we're going to have that same kind of concept uh, with the variables where environments are going to take precedence over just our repository secrets. And those are going to take precedence over our org secrets, depending upon if I'm deploying to that environment, if I'm using this repo. Okay. Are there is there anything around uh, to your point about the uh, the approvals and the controlling the deployment branches, which is awesome, right? Like I only want main to go to prod. That's an awesome real life kind of example. I think yep. well, it depends a lot on on what an organization's branching strategy and so on is. But I don't think it's that off the wall to say the main branch is the only one that should go to prod. For a lot of orgs, I think that's a fair yeah. statement. Um, what about uh, the we had we had talked earlier about how you could have multiple jobs executing concurrently, right? Is there a way to manage that concurrency when it comes to deploying to environments? Yeah, um, there is. And that's that's called concurrency. Uh, so with concurrency, like let's say we only want one job anywhere to access this environment at the same time. So if we're doing infrastructure as code deployments or software deployments or database deployments, we might not want two things to go hit the same environment at the same time. You could have bad uh, issues, you know, could be in a bad state. Or let's say if something is already running and you want to have, like concurrency can be used if you have like five dev builds all from the exact same branch and you really only care about the latest one finishing, you can do that. You can cancel that one in progress. Okay. All right. So that when we talk about the CD part of CI CD, right, whether we're talking about continuous delivery or continuous deployment, when we say CD back to that, is there a human or not? In both of those cases, once you start doing this kind of automatic magic is happening, right? That's where some of this stuff really comes up, right? To make sure that things aren't stepping on each other. So, um, okay. Uh, so we've got a uh, an end-to-end -end view as well, right? Because I'm looking at the clock and we've got about 15 minutes left. And I think this is a yeah. good time. This is kind of a good point to maybe bring it all home, I think, because we've yeah. talked about a lot of the pieces. And I think We've talked about enough that somebody could start being productive, I think, in the GitHub Actions environment, especially if they're if they're either new or if they're coming from Azure DevOps, because we've been doing those uh, those analogies as we go through. I think it's a good time to maybe walk through a real kind of worked end-to-end -end example. Yeah, and so what I just did is I went new workflow. So if you have a repo, you can go to Actions, you can say new workflow, and it will detect your languages and and actually give you some sample workflows that you can look through. Like if I'm doing .NET, I do configure, it, it's doing a setup .NET, it's giving me a version, it's doing a restore, a build, a test. You can see I've got the marketplace right here where I could look for additional uh, actions. Now, I, I've got a couple of just quick things I'm gonna touch on before we get to the end, end demo since we have a couple minutes. Um, let's say I wanna do a Docker. Like Docker is very well supported um, in actions. You know, um, I have here's that not syntax I talked about earlier. Um, I can set my working directory, but I'm going to log into like Docker Hub and I'm going to use build and push. I'm giving it a folder and it's going to build and deploy some software so I can work iteratively. Well, Let's look at my uh, .NET one that looks like it just had a failure. 
So this is one of my end-to-end -end workflows. Um, and I'm going to bring up Visual Studio Code just to kind of show. Um, I've got a folder here. This is my .NET. You know, I've got my, my piece of software. Uh, it's doing an API. I've got some infrastructure as code uh, doing BICEP. And I want to build and release this. So I might not necessarily have it in this subfolder. But what I would do is I would uh, maybe have a source folder. I would have this code. I would just pull it down, uh, make my relevant changes, and push. I would check it in and push. And what we would look, look at um, when we're, we're running this pipeline is I'm going to do the checkout. So I'm, I'm leveraging checkout. I'm gonna, I want to get the code for my repository into my local working directory. Um, you can do some stuff command line down here, but what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm using .NET, I'm a, and I want to use version 6. Now, there is another action that will help if you have lots of builds called cache. So I looked this up, you know, and I, I, I went out to the marketplace, and I looked up the cache application, uh, you know, action. Under actions right here. There we go. And, you know, this, this lets you uh, define inputs for things that you want to cache and how you can restore them. So if you have multiple jobs that you want to cache, you, you can cache them. So, like, if I had to restore a lot of big projects, this caching would help me speed things up a little bit. And I'm using my NuGet packages to cache it, using my lock file. I'm that, doing a that, build. That helps a little bit with the um, starting with a clean slate each time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So these are some production things you might do if you're having big builds. You might not need it. Like a lot of people don't need the cache. But if your application starts to get large, maybe you do. Um, I'm running a build and I'm giving a configuration. I'm, I'm publishing it out to a folder. And now I'm uploading an artifact. So as I start to do end to end stuff, I'm isolating my build job where I'm doing my builds and I'm uploading that into my, my artifacts. I'm giving it a web app artifact that I can use in my deploy stage later. I'm also uploading my infrastructure as code, my bicep file, so I can use it later. And just like we talked about. And since and you're you're using in this case a, a fairly basic uh, Docker container is your goal, but you could certainly go more complicated and do like a Docker Compose or something like that. Yeah, if you want. Yep. Like it's really only limited by your imagination at that point, essentially. Yeah. So this one, my deploy stage, my deploy job, it needs my build job. I can't deploy if I didn't build it. Um, notice we had an environment before, so I can go back and show you. I have an environment.net. And that, that .NET environment, uh, let me just do it this way, that .NET environment is going to be right here. So I have a .NET environment. So I have me added as a reviewer, and I have some secrets. So these secrets aren't in my repo secrets. These are environment-specific secrets. And so... As I get my infrastructure as code, I'm doing a login. Now, this is a slightly older style of leveraging the Azure login. Uh, I mentioned it before that now we can use OpenID C Connect. So you don't need to store any sort of uh, client passwords or client secrets. Um, you can just give it a client ID and a tenant ID, essentially, and it'll do authentication. But this is one way to use Azure Login. And this is just like you're on the Azure CLI doing AZ Login. So it, it sets up the subscription and all the things that you need to do. And then I want to do a BICEP deploy. Well, a BICEP deploy essentially is an ARM deploy. So I'm using the ARM deploy task to push out my template. I'm giving it the resource group name, the subscription ID, the name of my app. And so I'm going to build and deploy an application through infrastructure, and then I'm going to get my source code and I'm going to deploy my co code out. Now I want to call out. You know, we're using secrets here. 
we're passing values into our, you know, we're doing with, we're passing values into our action to deploy. But then we're also, look at that. I'm referencing, okay, so I had some steps. I had deploy. So I, I gave my, my thing an ID. And then there's an output. So my bicep file has a, an output called web app name. So because it's creating infrastructure on the fly, I don't need the name of the web app. This gets me the dynamic output name. And that's what I'm going to deploy to. So I, I, I can build and deploy my infrastructure and my, my code. Nice, nice. Now, it looked like I had a failure at the last minute. So I'm going to try kicking it off again. And we'll, we'll talk through it. Um, This is again live demo situation, folks. So if this fails, yeah. we're just going to say that it's the demo gods being. Bad. But you can see we've got two jobs. Deploy depends on build. Um, it's now in progress. I manually triggered it, and what we should see some stuff up here as well. So if I if I just step back for a minute and go to this one, see I have two artifacts. It took six minutes. I have two artifacts. If I click into it, I can see my two artifacts down here, and I can actually click into them. And it'll download. I can open this up. And this is the bicep file that was packaged up, zipped, and uploaded. I uploaded my artifact. This is my web app. And if I wait for it to open and open it up, here is my, my DLL and you know app settings, JSON, and all those things from my, my previous package. So we've got about, yep. Look at this. So I mentioned approvals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has requested my review to deploy. So I, I can take a look and say, is it allowed to deploy to this environment? I can give it a comment. And now I can say, yes, you can go ahead and deploy. So and presumably you would have done that after looking at the logs and maybe talking to somebody if there were human processes or whatever, right? Yes. And now it's well, often deploying to Azure. Go ahead. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Let, yes. let, let's double check. So uh, it downloaded that zip, that IAC zip, and it ran our login. And I can see here it's, it is logged in, and it's given me some recommendations. Now, I mentioned this the older style. There's a new way of doing things to authenticate called OIDC, Open ID Connect. And this is a much more secure way. You can limit it by org, environment, branch. Um, and there's documentation here. Like th this is a really, um, really good and well documented uh, place. It's it's awesome, but um, it's running my ARM deployment. You can see it's it's validating the template. It's creating a deployment, so it's creating my infrastructure. All right. So I don't. This one probably going to take longer than we have, I think, to probably finish that. Um, what do you think? Is it? It'll take a few minutes, Beth. To yeah, it'll take a few minutes. Okay. So I think we've got about five, six minutes left. Um, so I'm thinking what we should probably do is switch back to the slides and finish things up. Does oh. that sound good to you? Well, we we were about to, but it looks like it just deployed some things. So let me go out to my resource group and refresh. It is just oh, look at that. How convenient. There's some yep. folks in the chat, by the way, saying that they enjoy this demo. And so don't get too hung up if something fails, that they that they appreciate it. Um, yeah. So it's, I don't know why it's tripling the logs. That, that's kind of weird to me. But uh, it, it's, it's doing the deployment. Um, yeah. And it's running that. And it should be done in just a moment. So it finished. So if I go up here and I look at my web app, th this is my web app. Um, oops. And let's see here. Let's go take a look at it.
So it's probably oh. just spinning up. There it is. There, so look at that. that. So All right. I've got a website that got infrastructure created on the fly, Woo! website deployed, and we're running. All That's from awesome. a pipeline. Just in time. We just snuck in under the wire there. So, all right, let's switch back to the slides to kind of finish yeah. up, I think, here. Um, so we've got a, uh, just to kind of summarize what we talked about. We talked about GitHub Actions and Workflows, and we talked about jobs and runners, runners running jobs, which are made up of steps and the actions that are part of those steps. Uh, we, we talked about how to customize that a little bit with variables and secrets. And we actually had an end-to-end -end deployment of a CI CD workflow. Um, as a reminder, if you go to the AKMS Learn Live 20220629 B is in boy uh, URL, that is where Chris's collection is posted that has links to uh, learn contents. Uh, there's all kinds of information about uh, other kinds of uh, links that are out there. Uh, and we're actually not this second, but we're going to switch back and show you that here in a moment, um, just to kind of finish up a little bit of our mandatory stuff, and then we'll switch back to, to that. The full Learn Live series, AKMS, Learn Live dash Fast Track dash Launch. There's a QR code for it there as well. That's where you can go back and see what sessions are out there, uh, do the on demand as, as, as well, see previous sessions, as well as upcoming sessions. Um, and this is kind of important for us, to be honest, because we're, this is a new thing we're experimenting with. The idea of the Learn Live with us as Fast Track engineers doing this with you and presenting it, kind of approaching this from a, from a real life experience point of view. And so folks going and kind of reviewing that and so on, it's, it's important. That's part of how they're aware of the fact that folks care about this and they want to see more of this. So AKMS Learn Live Fast Track Launch. We also have the AKMS Learn Live 20220629B. Uh, and I think we're going to switch back to Chris's uh, uh, screen here just to show you a little bit of what's on that just as we finish up here. Yeah, yeah so there we go. I brought up the Learn Live. We've got some really great topics here, um, including like polarization and the. We've got a bunch of amazing presenters. But the collection I have, and I just want to talk a couple of about a couple of the things there. Um, I've got a couple of modules here and learning paths, which if you've not used Learn, it is an amazing platform. They have descriptions of stuff. They have a discussion of the flows. They have diagrams. It's really great stuff to learn. They give you examples, and 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 then. The learning paths have a ton of detailed conversation and detailed stuff. And, they and these include, by the way, knowledge checks. You can see there's a knowledge check there. And in some cases, there's actually exercises as well. Like right now, Chris has got a yeah. you know, lab there where you're able to actually go and do these things hands-on and get some real-life experience with it. Now, I, I linked to a lot of the pages that we showed, but this one I didn't. This one I, I, I think you should go visit. It's really cool. We talked about workflows work on pretty much anything. You can work on if somebody made an issue or did a pull request or, ma or made a branch or a tag. These are free. And these are really cool because all they are are GitHub repos that as you start using them and you make a, a pull request or you make a fork, guess what? There's a bunch of workflows that trigger. And so if you were to create something, it's going to then go and check if it's a template, it's gonna, you know, update steps and, and do things and, and like add comments to your pull requests. Like it's really cool. And they have all sorts of skills in here about the GitHub actions and continuous integration. Um, highly recommend you check out skills and, and the other learn modules. So, that's yeah. That. <laughs> no, that's really cool. No, and I'm glad that you brought those up because it's nice for people to be able to see these links that we're talking about. So I think that's that's really good. There's some reference links there as well. Uh, and I think we may go back and uh, if we have access to the chat afterwards, which I actually don't remember if we do or not, but if we do, uh, we'll we'll go ahead and add some of those links in to the, uh, to the collection later as well because it's something we can live edit. So with that, we're pretty much up at the time, I think. We're like right there. So 
Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Hopefully you found it useful. Um, Chris and I definitely enjoyed doing this for you. That was pretty great. So uh, hopefully uh, this was useful to you and uh, good luck with your, with your future GitHub Actions efforts. Thank you so much for joining us all. I appreciate you guys giving us your time today and, and this will be available uh, as a recording later. So please come back and use it as a reference if needed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.